what scale rose Today in Across the Fence, we'll get a close-up look at some of Vermont's reptiles and amphibians as they begin to emerge from a long, cold winter. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. One of the many delights of spring is witnessing the re-emergence of nature. We'll see it in the buds and the blooms and the births of all sorts of creatures. With the world reawakening all around us, it's a wonderful time to be outdoors. For a class at the University of Vermont, it's a wonderful time to study outdoors with a focus on some of nature's least understood animals. Across the Fences, Rebecca Gollin has our story. It's springtime in Vermont. Signs of life are emerging all around. Somebody find a garter somewhere? For these UVM students, that means that it's time to get up close and personal with their subject. She didn't have anything, she didn't even have food in there. I don't think she had a meal yet this year. It's spring. We've come from a long, cold, icy winter, snowy season, um, and these animals are just starting to kind of, kind of wake up. Um, and uh, certainly right now it's pretty warm in the sun, which is nice for me, but super nice for you know a lot of the amphibians and reptiles. Seasonal inflows. The class is herpetology, and the students are spending this day on a field trip in Rutland County. Like. Well, we cover the amphibians and reptiles of Vermont, so that's everything from the big green-faced frogs like green frogs and bullfrogs to the turtles, the painted turtles, snapping turtles, uh, spiny soft shells, and then into the snakes. Reptiles and amphibians are a great conservation vehicle because uh, students can handle them, they can see them, they can learn about them, and they don't migrate. They're right here, and if they're going to persist, it's because we're managing things right here. Count them. Professor Jim Andrews teaches a variety of herpetology and ornithology classes around the state. 25? Time spent in the field, dear, 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 observing dear. and learning about these animals in their natural yeah. habitat is invaluable. When you introduce people to the individual species and show them the habitat where they're found, they get a chance to handle them and interact with them. It's like being introduced to somebody in your neighborhood. It's the first step. Yeah, they're all like softball size. Yeah, okay. You know, these field trips where we really get to get out here and see the stuff, of just they're great learning experiences. And especially with the herps, on, unlike some of the other species, you get to handle them, which is big because you can see it, you feel a connection towards it. And I think that's pretty cool. Taylor Swanson is a wildlife biology major at UVM. Yeah, I've been a little bit of a herp nut for a long time, since I was a little kid. He plans to pursue a career in the herpetology world. I just find them absolutely fascinating. They're so far beyond us as mammals in terms of their adaptations for living that it's just remarkable to study. I mean, between regenerative abilities in salamanders and scaled armor in snakes and their ability to travel without arms, it's just remarkable. And this species is... Ring neck. How do we know it's a ring neck snake? Ring on the neck. Oh, it's more. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Along with identification and natural history of the various species, conservation is a major topic in class. Amphibians in particular, because they have permeable skin, that means it's not as waterproof as our skin is, so they could take in whatever is dissolved in the water, whether it be rain, whether it be these ponds, goes right through their skin into their blood. They don't have to eat it, they don't have any of that. It goes right through the skin into their blood. So, so anything in the air or in the environment ends up inside these creatures. In addition, many amphibians and reptiles have very specific habitat needs, spending part of their time in the water and part on land. Their range is often so small that an individual landowner could own land that encompasses the entire range of that individual or group of individuals. And whether or not they persist is entirely dependent upon our management on our land or our property or our yard or town forest or county. That's kind of a heat-loving snake. So if we can find this snake, we should be able to find other snakes. Although this is a sunny spring day, the weather is on the cool side. That means the students have to look extra hard to find some of these cold-blooded species. 
Where do you look for them? What are some of the techniques that you guys have learned? So here we're in kind of a diverse habitat. We've got some rock, slate rock piles, uh, as well as some like early successional forests uh, with a lot of coarse woody debris and rocks. So we're mainly looking for snakes under these slate slabs, um, ring neck snake, common garter snake. There's a little pond right behind us uh, that could harbor some water snakes just emerging. Um, but I imagine you can find some more redback salamanders in the more wooded area over here. And, and there's peepers coursing in the back. Um, and I'm sure some frogs down by the pond side. Each find brings the students together to study the unique features of that animal. A lot of these species, like the spotted salamander I mentioned earlier, can live into their 20s. And I think that's really incredible. Um, and, you know, one female spotted salamander, in the 20 years she lives, produces thousands of eggs herself. What color is his upper lip? Yellow. Pale. It's kind of pale, a pale yellow. Can I convince you of that? Yes. Pale yellowish green. It's not white. With the many individual characteristics of each of these species, even a lifelong herp nut like Swanson is learning something new. I definitely found it very surprising that some of the amphibian species can freeze themselves. This is something I didn't know. I assumed it was impossible and, you know, very sci-fi out there. But uh, species like wood frogs and a couple others in the Pseudochris family can draw the water out of their cells and then they'll freeze the water outside of the cells. And they'll effectively turn into a small ice cube and they don't have to burrow underground like a lot of the other species, which is very remarkable. Um, other species like turtles will overwinter on the bottom of the pond so they don't even need to come up for oxygen. They'll, they'll reconfigure their breathing methods like on spiny soft shells they'll, they'll change instead of breathing into their lungs they will have capillaries that fill inside their throat and it will actually pull the dissolved oxygen right out of it and they just kind of sit there on the bottom and overwinter. So stuff like that I, I just think is remarkable. The data the students are collecting will be entered into the Vermont Reptile and Amphibian Atlas, a project that Andrews coordinates. Anyone can contribute to the atlas, which helps to track numbers and distribution of species around the state. And so what might we expect to breed in here? Wood frogs. Wood frogs, definitely. Uh, I heard spotted salamanders from down that end. There's a world hidden just under the surface, and these UVM students are learning how to find it. In Castleton, I'm Rebecca Gollan with Across the Fence. Thank you, Rebecca. For our next segment, we flash back to fall. That's when we found a program that involved immigrants to Vermont who were putting food on people's plates with a crop that's new to Vermont. Keith Silva explains. This is rice, and it's growing in Vermont. It's not a joke, uh, there, it, but, it, but it is very interesting. This quarter acre of rice in Burlington's Intervale is a pilot project of new farms for new Americans. The program is sponsored by the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. The rice being grown here is a cold hardy Japanese variety that is well suited to Vermont's climate. University of Vermont Extension began working with new farms for new Americans on this project in the spring. For rice growing here in the Northeast, you do need to get a head start and plant the, the starts in the greenhouse at the beginning of the season. So we, we taught the growers how to maintain, how to manage the greenhouses. Um, they led the way when it came to actually planting the rice starts in the greenhouse. We also um, worked a lot with the irrigation systems, with the water systems here. Um, water is, is obviously critical for, for flooded rice paddy production, so we did a lot of sort of repairs and maintenance on the irrigation systems, um, understanding how to use a, a gasoline generator pump to pump out of the river. And then we're also working through just the general agronomic variables of rice production, so whether or not it needs fertilizer, if so, what time of year does it make sense to spread it, um, what are the typical pests and disease challenges that we should all consider. 
in efforts to, to, to boost yields and, and, um, and bring rice to the marketplace. For all his knowledge about pests, pumps, and fertilizer, it may be Waterman who's learning the most. They've been growing rice for, for generations, um, so they are teaching us a whole lot. Um, we hope to be able to transfer some of that knowledge to other farmers here in the Northeast. So I look forward to that opportunity. It's, it's building community. Um, it's building that, that sense of, of pride and that sense of place, that sense of belonging here. Um, so I really enjoy seeing that happen. For the Bhutanese, rice is as much of a food as it is a cultural connection. Along with a lifetime of knowledge of how to grow rice, these farmers also continue the tradition of neighbor helping neighbor. Rita Neopani has been living in Burlington since 2010. For her, this small crop of rice is an invitation to her fellow Vermonters. Our community wants to show them like how to grow rice in Vermont, in Burlington, you know, and then like that's locally organic rice. And then we want to show to them like we are hard worker people. Like Neopani, Saran Kitri is a native of Bhutan as well. He looks forward to the day when he can grow a lot more rice in his new home. So it's, it's uh, about the community. Uh, this is very tiny. Uh, we did a trial, you know, start uh, with little. Uh, we are testing whether it grows, this variety grows here or not. Um, now it looks good. So if my community, you know, helps me, uh, we want to expand this to a lot bigger. You know a lot about rice. You're very smart. Yes, yes. I know. Yes. <laughs> now, Bhutan is sandwiched between China and India on the eastern slopes of the Himalayan mountains. The climate of Bhutan is tropical in the south, but in the north, the valleys are hot in the summer and cold in the winters. For Indra Hadka, Vermont's weather feels familiar. Um, she likes Vermont. It's very nice. Very quiet and peace place. She like it. Is it like Bhutan at all? Bhutan just too sorry. Um, little cooler, cold than Bhutan. This place is little colder than Bhutan, it's, but it's similar. Because this is a pilot project, the majority of the rice being harvested will be saved as seed. It's expected the yield from this quarter acre will be enough seed for two or three acres next year. Alicia Laramie is the coordinator of the New Farms for New Americans program. You know, it's like gold. You want to save it for the next year so that you can get a higher yield. So I think this year a small amount will be um, taken for, for folks within the community to eat. We're going to start testing some markets locally to see what kind of uh, markets are out there and what kind of interest there is in terms of rice. And then with whatever is left over, which will probably be the bulk of, of, the, of what we harvest, we'll save to plant next year. Laramie sees how this small amount of rice has a big impact when it comes to empowering this community of new farmers and new Vermonters. I think the, the rice project has been a wonderful opportunity um, for members of the New American community to come to me and come to the program and say this is what we're interested in doing and for our program to be able to support this. It really makes for not just a community of, of New Americans, but a community outside of, of this community. So now we're, we're reaching out to people all over Vermont and outside of Vermont, too. And so I just think it's, it's great for, I mean, I, I really like the, the partnerships that are starting to develop because of it. Neopani couldn't be any happier with the new friends she's made in Vermont. In fact, she's looking forward to making even more friends. And of course, growing more rice. We want to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> we will get to know each other. And we connect with the land. And then uh, we are doing an excellent job, like first time in Burlington, rice growing. And then 
People love it. America has been called a nation of immigrants. New people in a new place, here to learn and here to teach. It's an ideal world in which everyone can grow. In Burlington, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Thank you.